Would you care? Ah, I do have sound. I hear myself. It's always very, you know, surprising to hear yourself. I think we have limited amount of time, so I propose we start. Some people may still be coming in, and they are more than welcome. Um, I am uh, Diana Benning. I am the acting head of unit of the unit C2 in DGRTD, which is called Bioeconomy and Food Systems. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the session, which is called Food, Feed, Fibers, Fuels, Enough Biomass for a Suitable Bioeconomy. Bio so the session, um, first let me explain, uh, there will be an opening presentation and then there will be two TED style talks by my honorable panel members. And after that, we'll engage uh, in an in interactive debate. So please hold your questions to the end. But if we um, manage to keep our timing, which is uh, our ambition and which I'm sure we'll do, there will be time, 15 minutes for your questions. Um, let me first explain you what uh, bioeconomy is um, so that we're all on the same page. Um, bioeconomy covers all sectors and systems that rely on biological resources. And this could be from animals, plants, microorganisms and derived biomass, including organic waste, their functions and principles. And it includes and interlinks, of course, with land marine ecosystems and the service they provide, all primary production sectors that use and produce biological resources, agricultural, forestry, fisheries and aquaculture, and all economic and industrial sectors that use biological resources and processes to produce food, feed, bio-based products, energy, and services. It's a mouthful, I must say. No. Sustainable bioeconomy needs to address multiple challenges, and we are facing an increased demand for biomass, and this is fueled by growing world population, climate change threats, changing consumption patterns and nutrition and environmental pressures. The objective of this session is to spark debate on how to best manage our biological resources and address the multiple demands for biomass, gathering key insights from experts and inputs from you, the audience. So after this short introduction, let me introduce our three panelists and thank you very much for being here. Dr. Janis Potocznik, which many of you know, a co-chair of the UN uh, Environmental Programme. Dr. Joachim Kreisa, who is advisor to the GSC Director for Strategy, Work Programme and Resources. And Professor Joachim von Braun, uh, Director of Bonn University Center for Development Research. So, now we'd like to give the floor to Dr. Potocznik who will talk about responsible resource management, biomass use, and its environmental impacts. Dr. Potoshnik has been commissioner um, for environment and research and development, innovation, and he is also the father of the KBBE, which is the knowledge-based bioeconomy. So thank you very much for being here, and I'll leave the, give the floor to you. Thank you. Um, the best way is to sit, because I see it easier if I sit. Uh, by the way, I would like to put the whole story of the bioeconomy in a perspective of what is today needed, how it's connected to some of the major questions which we are dealing with, how it's connected to SDG, the SDGs, how it's connected to circular economy. So, uh, I think uh, before starting, I would just like to say that food, feed, fibers, fuels enough biomass for sustainable bio economy is actually for me quite a strange title and question and maybe would be better food, feed, fibrous fuels, how to manage biomass in a responsible way to secure sustainable bioeconomy because that's actually what we have to do. But uh, let me start uh, the story in my home country, Slovenia. The most famous Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek uh, just recently said, it is clear that we are approaching the ecological and digital apocalypse, but we should not lose nerves he was actually continuing with a quote of somebody even more famous than him, that was Mao Zedong, who said, everything under heaven, it's in utter chaos. The situation, it's excellent. So I will not explain you the logic and the reasons why we are in utter chaos, because you know it probably as much as I do. The only thing which I would like really to draw your attention is that we are the first generation ever, ever, 
living in socio-ecological space of planetary scope. So my father was still using a horse to travel from my hometown town to, the, to the nearest uh, town uh, because we were innkeepers to get uh, some of the things he needed. So we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever humans were which means that our individual and collective responsibility for the future has enormously increased. It was very nicely uh, summarized by the Club of Rome, which basically said that we have moved from so-called empty world, which was dominated by nature, to the full world, which is dominated by humans. While in the empty world, it was labor and infrastructure, which were the limiting factors of human well-being. In the full world, it is actually natural resources and environmental things which are the limiting factor of human well-beings. Remember that because that's the essence of all what we are actually doing and why we are actually doing it. So, when we approach from the scientific point of view to analyze, in particular, environmental consequences, we normally use the approach which is called DPSIR, D-P-S-I-R, this stands for drivers, P for pressures, S for state, I for impacts, and R for response. And whenever we talk about climate change, whenever we talk about biodiversity loss, pollution, we basically talk about state and impact. If you would want to really address those questions seriously, you need to go, of course, to drivers and pressures. And drivers and pressures are immediately, uh, when you say that, you say humans and human activity, which, as you know, it's called economics. I'm actually co-chairing UN International Resource Panel. So we are dealing with resource management. And what we try to do is establish a bridge between economy where resource management is actually decisive for their competitiveness and between the consequences which this irresponsible resource management is causing, including the climate change and the biodiversity loss. So why I'm saying that? Because the policies are then different. And if we are there, then let us quickly look to the major problems of our economy and where we actually are. This is a presentation of Inclusive Wealth Index, which is actually a kind of GDP+. Plus. Data were published last year by United Nations, and data are for the last 22 years, uh, which, uh, uh, are, which were possible to reach them. So if you look to the, to the grey dotted line, which is on the top, you would see that production capital, which is one of the components, has in these 22 years increased for almost 100%. Practically, it's the same curve as the GDP growth per capita curve, as you can also see it, just it's the gray, non-dotted. Then the next one is blue dotted, which is human capital, which was in those years more or less stand still. And the last one is the green one, the natural capital per capita which in those 22 years actually decreased almost for 40%. Conclusion, it's relatively simple. The growth of GDP in the last decades was achieved at the cost of depleting natural capital. So in short, we are indebting future generations. So if I summarize that, putting that on the market economy, where producers and consumers apparently behave rationally, even if this is the most irrational assumption which we economists have, because the whole history of human behavior is irrational behavior. Then we see that quantities are basically reached uh, and the equilibria on the basis of the incentives, prices which we are sending to the system. If I simplify, production capital, it's overvalued, as we have seen from the previous uh, slide. Human capital is undervalued and natural capital is not valued at all. So if we think that through that kind of signals which we are sending on the markets, we will achieve economic, social and environmental balance, we should wake up. This will never happen if we don't fundamentally change the way we produce and consume. So this is from Environmental Agency uh, uh, European, which basically said economic system should be the function of the ecosystem. And the major problem in that, are, of course, environmental externalities. As commissioner, I've heard many times, believe me, that you cannot introduce that and that because these are additional costs for our private sector. They are not additional costs. These are costs which are existing, but we simply don't record them. We deny them. So they are not paid by producers and consumers. They are either paid by the health system or in majority of the cases, they are paid by the next generation, which, as I said, it's basically indebting the next generation. So in essence, 
the system in which we are living is privatizing the profits and socializing the costs. Resources, to a large extent, were the missing link in that story. If you look to the 17 SDGs, 12 out of 17 are directly, the success is directly connected to the responsible resource management. And we have just recently published our global resource outlook, which is pointing to major developments in the last 50 years. Then uh, to, uh, we looked also to the consequences in health and environmental area. And finally, we also uh, created scenarios for the future development. But I will share with you only two slides that you will understand where we are and where we go. Resources which we took into account, and they are, of course, providing good services and infrastructure to make our current socioeconomic system a uh, biomass, which we talk today, wood, crops, food, fuel, feedstock, plant-based materials, then metals, fossil fuels, non-metallic minerals, actually land and water were also part of the analysis, but not so much. And the first conclusion, which is relatively simple, that in the high-income countries like Europe, we consume per capita 27 tons of various materials, while in low-income countries like Africa, two to three tons, so 13 times more in our countries. But let us look to three conclusions from the development in the last 50 years. First, global resource use has more than tripled in the last 50 years. Per capita has almost doubled, which means that a lot of that tripling actually goes on the burden of economic growth, not so much on the population growth. And finally, which is quite shocking, material productivity, which is in essence the efficiency of the use of resources, how much of GDP we produce from the, from the resources which we are using, has been, that's the black line which you see on the graph, was, increased, was increasing till the year 2000 and then it started globally to decrease. How, how it's possible? that globally this line productivity is actually decreasing if it is increasing in all the countries. So the things which you are wearing, the things which you are buying today, the TVs and so on, were before produced in more, more resource-efficient countries, like Japan, like Europe. Now they are produced in Bangladesh, they are produced in Indonesia, they are produced in China, which are less resource-efficient. So, in essence, for the unit of GDP, we actually today use more resources than we have used uh, before the year 2000 globally. When we look to environmental impacts in the value chain, we looked only to resource extraction and processing phase. We find three basic conclusions. First, 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress are connected to resource extraction and processing. If you would look left on the figure down there, you would see those very green circles which means that that 90% is more or less connected to how we manage biomass. So if we want to deal with biodiversity loss, which is land-related, and with the water stress, it is no way without tackling food systems and agriculture. Second, 50% of the global change impacts are related to that, and even one-third of the air pollution health impacts. Why I'm saying even one-third of the health-related pollution impacts, because the use phase is not included in analysis, and you, we know that the use phase is here decisive. But if I translate you, if you buy your car and if you park it for the whole life, you have already created one-third of the pollution, because extraction of those materials and production of that car is causing that kind of a pollution. So the concept which we are actually supporting, it's so-called decoupling concept, we are not against growth, uh, not against the well-being because we do believe that there are many people in the world which still need that. But we believe that this is only possible in the future, seeing the consequences of today, if we decouple the growth and well-being from the resource growth and altogether from environmental impacts. So, for me, circular economy is an instrument to deliver decoupling. So it should be seen as part of the bigger picture of this economic, societal and cultural transformation needed to deliver the SDGs, which leads me to the topic which we are addressing today, circular economy and bioeconomy. So that's a bit simplified picture. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the famous butterfly of Ellen MacArthur Foundation. On the left-hand side, you have biomass, you have 
biological resources. On the right-hand side, you have non-biological, non-renewable resources. So, in essence, when, when we connect it with the circular economy, we talk about how much can we replace the non-renewable resources with renewable resources, of course, respecting the limits which we, in our open question, have to take into account. One nice example. The major problem today in agriculture is basically how you protect uh, the plants, so how you actually heal the plants, which are so how you use pesticides, because pesticides are problematic for water, they are problematic for soil, they are problematic for, um, uh, for biodiversity loss. So today, if 5% of the plants are ill, you put the pesticides all across the field. Precision farming using the drones robots, it, robots, it's already allowing us that we basically use it on the specified plants. But this is still rewarding the pesticides producers in a way that they have more profit if they sell you more pesticides. And that's the problem, because economy is actually quantity driven. If you would replace the situation so that they would actually sell you the protection of the hectare of the field, that would entirely change the philosophy. Because the producer would be incentivized to sell you less pesticides because pesticides suddenly became the cost for him and not the profit. So in circular economy, in bioeconomy, you always have to try to follow the logic how to reverse the incentives which goes into the systems. Second, forests are the heart of circular bioeconomy. I have intentionally put it on the screen because too many times they are not taken enough seriously into consideration. They are the largest terrestrial carbon sink and main source of precipitation, oxygen and biodiversity, and they are the largest source of non-food, uh, non-food, non-feed renewable biological resources. Some interesting questions which should and could be addressed in that respect. How to improve nutrient cycles, circular design of bio-based products, integrating well-informed consumers to better play their role, renewable carbon potential, waste prevention, better waste management, and I could continue. Some obstacles and challenges which we will all together have to deal with, trade-offs between biomaterials, bioenergy farming, fiber fuel, food, and with other services provided by ecosystems, oxygen, water, temperature regulation, nutrients, biodiversity, needs to be well managed and taken into account. Second, the definition of cascading, it's not universal. Third, supply of sustainably produced biomass and soil balance should be ensured. Fourth, mixing bio and technical materials could create difficulties for circular economy, you know very well, in particular when it comes to recycling. Substitution of products should be dealt with care after assessing environmental impacts. Focus should not only be on the products and materials, but as I have explained before, also on systems and business models. Bioeconomy, in short, has a major development potential, but it has to respect sustainability criteria and it has to be complementary and in line with the coupling and circular economy principles. To conclude, why and how? Important messages which I do believe they are worth to remember. First, the existing global resource use trends and their environmental and health impacts are extremely worrying and cannot and should not continue. Second, circular economy based on the concept of decoupling is an essential ingredient of an economy which would be compliant with sustainable development goals. Third, if appropriate policies, including resource efficiency, are applied according to our modeling, which I have not presented to you, the world which is in line with SDGs is possible. Circular economy and bioeconomy solutions are an important part of the answers to climate change challenges and also to biodiversity loss. And finally, Bioeconomy has a major role to play, but it is essential that, like the rest of the economy, respects the sustainability criteria. According to World Economic Forum, the challenge seems not to be any more inadequate scientific evidence, but rather the cooperation and implementation. Complexity and scale of these challenges require simply new forms of collaboration and more systemic approaches. So, in a way, we need more circularity even in a global governance. So if I put it in the language of circularity, we need more share, sharing sovereignty than owing sovereignty. And the best example is actually European Union, because a few decades ago, we have decided 
to share sovereignty, to avoid some of the major problems which we have seen in conflicts and wars on the European territory. We have many problems, but we should be absolutely proud on the project which we have achieved uh, till now. So Europe, for me, it's not blue with yellow stars only. It's a rainbow. It's blue for freedom and democracy. It's red for social values. It's green for protection of the environment. It's yellow for the culture. We can hardly picture Europe as the center of the world, but we should do everything that Europe remains the center of the dreams of the people of the world. And that's what we are. And you should remember that and be proud. Maybe the most important slide, when, everybody, when anybody starts with but, just stop him immediately. It's not about but, it's about how. Transition to a more sustainable economy and society, it's simply unavoidable. Humans are supposed to be intelligent and it's high time to prove it. So we have to fix a broken compass. But, as I said, stop me. It will not be easy. This is half serious, half joke. Uh, when Albert Einstein was asked why he believes that we are so intelligent that we discovered the atomic energy, but we are not intelligent enough to master it, he said, that's simple, my friend, it's because politics is more difficult than physics. And bioeconomy and circular economy are actually physics. So we try to put everything in the context of what we have in the nature, which is the factor which we have to respect. Unfortunately, the answer is in the hand of politics. Why are the challenges, this change is so difficult in practice? These are the three final conclusions. I do believe that the major problem is that while all those challenges which we are facing are, are requiring a system change approach, all our life, all political cycles, all financial institutions, all public institutions, even majority of the private sector is organized on short, short term basis. This will not deliver the answer. This incons inconsistency is limiting our ability for efficient strategic action. Second, production and consumption are based on the logic of consumerism, which is fueled by quantity driven profits and growth measured by GDP. I'm normally trying to explain GDP by saying you will not reach the goal faster if you are walking faster in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what we are doing with the GDP. So it's fundamentally that we change the fundamentals of economics. And finally, a transition to a more sustainable economy and society will only be possible if it's just fair and inclusive. A lot of investment in the past was done by people in a belief that they are doing the right things. We need public funds to help them and stop doing stupidity with public subsidizing fossil fuels and other things which are basically protecting the status quo. So, North Star guiding our policies and behavior should absolutely be SDGs. The Green Deal which Commission is working on, for me, would need to be a kind of intergenerational agreement which would put a sustainability first. Greta Thunberg, it's not the symbol of, in the first place, of the awakened young generation. It's a symbol of a failure of our generation. And we should be ashamed that we need a 16 years old girl to tell us what we, by the way, all know. That's uh, the last message which I would like to share with you. Circular economy and bioeconomy are not new concepts. They are the oldest concept on the earth. All nature is bio-based and organized on the principles of the circular economy. Nothing is lost. Everything has its purpose. So the real question which we are discussing today is, do we agree that humans are part of the nature too? And if you have the problem answering that question, then please do ask for the advice. The most famous Belgian, that's the <laughs> Hercule Poirot, when he was one asked why he's speaking about himself always in the third person, he replied something like that. If somebody is such a genius like myself, it is very important to establish a healthy distance to himself. So yes, that's the answer which we should provide. We are intelligent, but we should be so intelligent that we establish a healthy distance to ourselves and behave with respect to something which is our home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring 
presentation. I think it's uh, many take home messages for the people here in the audience and also for my colleagues uh, working for the bioeconomy program. Second speaker, and I think you would need also the, the, the little buttons. Um, Dr. Kreiser, I invite you to present the GRC work on biomass supply and consumption in Europe. Uh, Dr. Kreiser has been long-term member of the uh, European research family, back. already starting to work uh, on the second framework program, you told me, and now we're in preparation of the ninth. So we have a very experienced person giving input <coughs> on the GSC biomass supply. The floor is yours. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. In fact, I have a very small number of slides. Um, this first one just tries to give you a kind of overview of how we have analyze the situation as it is today. Um, and if I say we, these are a lot of colleagues in the JRC who have been working from many different sources. And one of the big problems is that all these sources have using different um, units and they did a lot of trying to harmonize this. So I would call what we have today as the best possible approximation to the truth with regard to the supply of biomass in the EU 28, still 28, and um, the current use. So this is then the same slide, but with figures on it. And you see that we source about 1 billion tons every year, mainly from agriculture and forestry, and a little bit from for fishery and aquaculture. Um, we have a net import also of, uh, in, that, in that sector, but we are using 1.2 billion tons. So this additional 2 billion is already recycling, mainly wood-based materials, which is uh, coming used as at least a second time. Quite a lot of the recycling goes into bioenergy and quite a lot into material uses, some into animal feed and bedding. Interesting to see the biggest use of biomass is for animals, which means meat and dairy production. Only a very small fraction, 9% of the total, goes into direct food consumption. Um, another big uh, use is in bioenergy, with 23%, and material uses. And material uses in our classification includes all the bio-based products. Um, <coughs> On the level of the use, that means the processed biomass, we have net imports of about 40, not net exports, uh, sorry for this. You also see that for the time being, the biomass volume coming out of the sea and aquaculture is relatively small. These are figures on uh, 2015. As I said, we know that there are uncertainties in it, but we are quite confident that the order of magnitude is correct. So the question which we are trying to address today is, is it enough? And um, Janusz Potosznik already said, we need to manage our resource in a clever way. It is limited and we cannot easily increase the supply dramatically. I would guess that we can come up to something like sustainable 1.5, 1.4, billion tons of dry biomass. That's more or less the the limit which we can we can see. So, is the demand is it too high? And to answer this question, the, there are many ifs, mainly economic, less technologic. We can do a lot more than we are doing today, some regulatory ifs which we have to overcome. So if these ifs are not realized, the principle, the answer would be no, we don't have enough biomass to simply replace fossil uh, one to one, it's not enough. But yes, if we manage it correctly, we might have enough biomass to go at least a, a, a long way. The point is we should use less feed and we have a discussion on changing food patterns. If something happens in this direction, we will have some reserves there. The other point is obviously biofuels. In the moment we need it in order to reach our, our uh, energy objectives. But 
if other renewables are picking up, if we are really going into electrification as electricity comes from wind and sun, we might not need as much. If these two very big ifs are met, then we might even be able to meet increased demands for food and fiber. And we are talking a lot about bio-based products, thinking also on, on chemicals. In a Z field, CCU, the carbon capture and use, might come in the longer term future as main resource for carbon. So at the end, the take home message, Yes, we have enough biomass to meet the demands if and once biofuels in particular can be minimized and we also reduce feed. Circularity and efficiency of biomass use is essential and bio-based products should not pose a major problem. In the moment, only 14% of the fossil oil which we are importing is used in the non-energy sector. So if you want to replace that, we are talking about less than what we are using today for bioenergy. And with this, um, I just can only underline that uh, the correct managing of this limited resource biomass is important, but we have a lot and we have to be um, innovative in using it and making the best out of it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you very much. I, I would like to just take the opportunity to ask you ask you one question, if, if I may. Um, okay. And that's more also because you, you addressed it um, briefly, but, but what, what would be the, the contribution that the bio-based sector can make to a circular and sustainable bioeconomy? How do you, how do you place that? I don't think it is the volume of biomass that mm. we consume. It is much more the type of biomass it consumes and, uh, and how it's consumed. It. Because many of the, these um, new bio-based product After developments, it. business models are small scale. Yeah. They can go into rural areas close to the biomass production, create new business, mm. create different types of jobs and make the whole thing much more interesting. But we need to use digital, digitalization, artificial intelligence to manage this in a clever way. And I could speak much longer about this, as you recognize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, unfortunately, thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is limited. We only have one hour. And I want to try to keep some time for questions for you at the end. But now I would like to give the floor to Professor Joachim von Braun, a leading name in bioeconomy food systems in Europe and beyond. Flo Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Let me stand up. Maybe I see more of you in the <laughs> back. Uh, good morning. Pleased to be here. Um, Mr. Potoshnik has already had a, a beautiful slide where the food system uh, was uh, appropriately placed in the overall uh, resource uh, utilization and bioeconomy context. I want to uh, introduce a few key points um, about the uh, food system, which is currently failing world consumption, nutrition and environment, and what needs to be done in order to move forward. Uh, in the middle of this small slide, uh, of this simplified picture of the food system, you find um, arrows with the uh, uh, nomenclature of efficiency, safety, availability, access, and diversity. And those are key linkages which food system needs to deliver, but currently does not. Um, the food system is um, in a rapid dynamics. Um, uh, we need to watch from a science perspective the supply side, but also the behavior and consumption side, the lifestyle, um, the issues of waste, uh, the nutrition issues the environmental footprints. Points of entry are not only these boxes on agriculture, employment, health, and markets, but are especially the arrows that connect them. That's the system's perspective. How big is this thing, the food system, the global food system? Um, agriculture covers five out of the nine billion non-desert land. The retail sector is only part of the food system, and that um, has an expenditure of $12 trillion a year, so that's 12,000 billions. 
about 30% of world employment is related to a food system. So it's big, but big is also the failure. Uh, One-fifth of uh, premature deaths is related to poor diet. So what needs to be done? What needs to be on our agenda? Let me just make these five points. Actions for sustainable food systems serving people and planet, serving the SDGs. Um, one, take a food systems perspective in the context of the circular bioeconomy. Not a sector perspective, but a systems perspective. That's the key. Secondly, towards end hunger, healthy diet, and sustainable consumption with information, education, incentives, and regulations. Third, capitalizing on the bioscience and institutional innovations for sustainable production and uh, consumption. Cutting waste and losses is a huge issue in the food system. Cutting them in half is an SDG target. We need to achieve that. That will save biomass and uh, gives opportunity to uh, uh, bioeconomy. And lastly, building better food system governance and actions, possibly through a food system summit, which is currently uh, being prepared for the year 2021, a food system summit. Not just a food summit, but a food system summit. And um, uh, I understand the Secretary General of the UN has uh, approved uh, the way forward to that, and I think that's a good idea. Europe has a key role to play in making a food system summit a success. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much. Maybe I can also ask a, a one first question before I, I give the floor to the audience. And, and my question there would be from, from this, from the from the actions you, you just presented. What what would you kind of be able to to summarize as summarize as the, the greatest challenges? Um, there, because there's so much to do, but which are, how can we prioritize? Uh, the greatest challenge, if you, if you look at what are the prime causes of um, uh, the malfunctioning of the food system currently, it is uh, mm -hmm. a war and conflict and it is climate change. So that's why uh, the food system challenges uh, uh, need to be addressed in a um, multilateral political initiative, um, and that applies to both, um, uh, reducing um, uh, the causes of hunger uh, because of war and conflict, and uh, addressing climate change, and the two are related. Climate change fosters uh, conflict, uh, resource conflicts in particular. But then there are technical issues which I think are known to the audience, which are uh, challenging uh, for us in the science community. So overcome monoculture with precision farming, uh, Mr. Potoshnik has already highlighted that, I think is a huge challenge for the science community. And uh, pushing forward um, uh, with uh, uh, institutional change that reduces uh, waste of water and waste of uh, food. Thank you very much. Do you want oh, to add? I, I just wanted to add because uh, I think both presentations were super excellent. And I think uh, the way you have concluded at the end, uh, you actually pointed ex exactly to the right question, which is at, at the end, I actually also um, uh, arrived to the same. It's, it, the governance issue is mm -hmm. the central issue because we have organized ourselves in a way that we are simply not capable of systemically answering some of the questions. If you just look to the European Commission, uh, DG Agriculture will certainly not be the most open-minded to food systems mm. because they prefer to have more focused view on the questions they have to deal with. But if you want to deal with multilateral political initiatives and so on, you need, you, you need to have this ability to look across your borders. Yes. Because that's, that's the only way uh, those questions can actually be addressed. Take home message I, I, for the I Commission. Think if I think if I may just to come to the defense of my, my colleagues, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in the run-up to the bioeconomy strategy, we had 14 DGs on the table, and it was co-authored by four DGs. One of them was DG Agri. The colleagues are opening up to this idea that 
it is a systems approach which we need, and the entire bioeconomy and circular economy debate which is there has certainly helped to develop this system thinking. So I, I, yeah. I would say we are on a good way, but not yet there. Yeah. No, that, uh, that's what, by the way, know exactly, but I was enough in the commission that <laughs> I know exactly what is the problem. So it is absolutely the need for openness and cooperation. Yes. The beating another DG, it's not the success. No. It's cooperating with yeah. them, joining the forces, and trying to address those questions. Yes. And too many times we look in a too narrow way. But uh, I think these are exactly the cross-cutting issues. Uh, uh, the whole bioeconomy story, it's very much cross-cutting issue. And uh, you have talked, and uh, some of you also opened, the, I think, you, the, the digitalization story. You know, we, we, we knew the solutions coming from the circularity decades ago. But they were simply not possible. The whole mobility revolution which is happening would not be possible without the real revolution which is happening in digitalization. And you can continue practically, in practically each, each and every area. So uh, mm -hmm. I have just recently had a nice presentation which is connecting those two areas. And there is a Dr. Kranzberg uh, first law of technology which is basically saying something like that and you can apply it for digitalization mm -hmm. uh, very much. Technology is not good, it's not bad, but it's not neutral. So <laughs> that's what is the yeah. problem. It's not neutral, yeah. so you have to make it good. And that's yeah. exactly what is our role to play. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if you can say about now for, for the future commission, you all know, you've heard about the, the Green Deal. And there it's, it's really a, a, a driving force for making all, all services work together. And we're working, we're putting there the results of, of, of the bioeconomy strategy and also the food system approach in this big machine that should make us work together at European level. But of course also at member states there's also work to do and there the bioeconomy strategy is also striving for implementation in, of the strategies in the member states and specifically also in, in, in the bio east action, so in the member states where this hasn't been done. Lots of work to do. We definitely uh, are not lying back yet. If, if it's okay with the members of the panel, I will give the floor sure, to sure. Sure. The, the, all the people in the, in the audience. If you have a question, I don't see you very much because of the light in my eyes, um, but the colleagues will, will give you the microphone. Please um, uh, tell us who you are and, and who you're working for, who you represent, and also clearly state to whom you would like to ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, do you hear me? Do Not hear? yet? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is uh, Berta Matas. I'm a senior researcher working at Sintef, is a non-profit Norwegian RTO. Um, actually, I would like to ask the question to the three of you <laughs> in terms of your view. So I have been working on the bioenergy, biofuels, uh, now fuel for over a decade. And even when looking at the title and looking at the bioeconomy, there's a lot of Fs, fibers and food, but the A, the E of energy is not there. So I would like to hear your views on whether you understand bioenergy as also part of the bioeconomy, especially looking at um, important uh, reports, IPCC report, we look at the International Energy Agency report as well, and also internally, if we look back home, and then home means even here in Europe, the Commission, we have the Strategic Energy Technology Plan where there is this specific action on renewables and energy, where obviously we are challenged to also look at bioenergy as an important uh, element, and we're looking at predictions and projections for 2050 in terms of heat and power, bioenergy is still supposed to play an important role. So if you could comment on that, please, thank you. Well, I was, in fact, expecting something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can I say something? We yeah, of currently will need bioenergy to Sorry, go out of the carbon-based no, no, no. energy supply as quickly as possible. Um, but I think it's also clear that um, we cannot solve the energy problem with bioenergy bio alone. Energy could eat up all the biomass which we can produce. Um, the other point is that it is very inefficient to use biomass to produce electricity. Um, you have um, about 0.1%, no, 1%, 1 or 2% of sunlight energy uh, captured by plants. 
while you have 25% for the same area with solar voltaic. So you can produce much more electricity with the same amount of, of, uh, of uh, land. Um, on the other hand, burning bio biomass um, at the end of its lifetime is at least better than doing nothing with it because the CO2 will anyway be released. Um, and there are certain areas in the fuel sector where for some time we don't see any other technical solutions than <coughs> using biomass as a carbon neutral source of carbon um, to produce jet fuels and these kind of things. So my long term expectation is that hopefully the other renewables will be able to take over and to supply the energy we need, um, which frees biomass from that use, uh, which is, as I said, relatively inefficient. And um, at the same time, if we have to use it for energy, we use it in the most efficient and effective way. Okay. Let me just add, uh, there's a session on uh, energy at uh, 14.45 this afternoon. I hope to see you there. Um, secondly, uh, that's why we shunned it here. Um, in Europe, probably bioenergy has some role to play uh, to stabilize renewable systems because um, it's a battery, you can use it as a battery. But in Africa, still about 60% of uh, primary energy is biomass based. That needs to come down and become more efficient. So it's a huge topic. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would just like to, because you pointed also to IPCC, and I would just like to, to put a bit of light on the things which are coming from the scientific community. We have. We have IPPC dealing with the climate change, we have IPBC, IPBS dealing with biodiversity, IRP is dealing with the uh, resource management, and then we have GEO. So these reports all came in year 2019, only the IPPC came 2018. I think, and I am pushing, by the way, very much uh, UNEP in that direction, that they would make a summary of summaries, because these are not complete reports, to be honest. If you look to the IPCC report, in many cases, that would be my critique of that. They are coming to some conclusions because they see relatively, they are doing, by the way, excellent work. So full stop, that I don't, that I'm not misquoted. But in many cases, they don't look uh, further than through the energy lenses. And the whole policy which we currently have, which is, to fight climate change has almost entirely energy lenses. But if we want seriously to address, energy is very important. The, the last report of Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which was released two days ago, is basically saying 55 of CO2 you could cut through energy, and, but 45 you, you can and you should cut through the materials, land, uh, water management. And that's not part of the policy currently today, and it's not also part of the analysis. So, in short, if, if you would imagine a system in which you have abundant energy, low price energy, all renewable energy, but the current production and consumption system in land, uh, mm -hmm. in, in food production, in um, uh, mobility, in housing, we have major, so we, we still still a major reserve for dealing with the questions which are connected to cutting CO2 exist. And that's why sometimes if you stay only with the energy story, you get frustrated because you can't see the way through how you can mm -hmm. cut all the uh, emissions which are necessary. And uh, that's why I firmly believe that if we want to deal with the climate story, you need three pillars. One is the energy supply pillar and energy, uh, the whole energy story. The second is the demand pillar, which is basically talking about decoupling materials, water, uh, land. And the third is nature-based solutions. And the second and the third pillar are, are currently not in the policy enough. By the way, interesting story, and I will end with that, it's also if you look to the Commission, I think best invention ever of the Commission was to put energy and climate together. But today, I would separate them. Mm. 
because they are becoming uh, a silo for themselves. They have to look beyond the energy story. It's more than that. And we have to start to combine the whole story of consumption which is happening beyond the energy if we want to have more complex system, system way answers which uh, uh, Professor was talking about to address effectively the story which we are dealing with. And all those things are, in essence, at the end, connected, and you simply have to place it on the right place and give them the right role. Thank you very much. Are there more? Ooh. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so please try to be very short. I'm not going to pick a letter. The colleagues pick somebody because I, I, I don't see very well. Um, please be short, and, and we try to be short in our answers so we can take uh, more I have questions. The microphone already. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't see you. I don't see you. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm from Aarhus University. Thanks for three very good presentations. Just to follow, I have two questions. First, to follow up on this latest discussion, and thanks for bringing that issue of the materials and, and the bio uh, materials into. And, and Dr. Kreis, a very good, clear presentation. Just a short question. The, is it correct that in the, I mean, it is correct that in the IPCC scenarios for 1.2 or 2 degree, uh, we stipulate that we do need to increase already now the carbon sequestration. That will take a lot of biomass. Is that included in your scenarios? Or is that beyond the 1.2 or the 1 billion uh, tons? A, 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 another question is for the other two uh, gentlemen uh, about the food systems. The food systems uh, approach is very established now. And we can draw intricate uh, illustrations of very complex systems and so on. I buy into that fully, and there's been a SCAR uh, strategic working group working on, on how this can be implemented from a research perspective. Now, I'd like your advice for that discussion on what can science do in order to identify the important leverage points? Because what is really uh, confusing us almost when we look at these food systems is where do we enter as scientists and as politicians? Even well-meaning politicians will need to know where are the most efficient leverage points that will create positive synergies in changing the food systems. Thank you. Who goes first? Okay, should I start with the sequestration? Um, very briefly, biomass or biological systems are sequestering, taking CO2 from the atmosphere when they grow. So a clever management of our biomass in a way that we keep them in the maximum growth situation um, is from the sequestration point of view interesting, in particular in forestry. The problem is obviously if you then immediately release the CO2 again by burning it, you have gained something if you, because of our replacing fossil, which you uh, CO2, but if you lock it in into materials and long-term materials, you can have at least a temporary storage of this uh, CO2 taken out of the atmosphere and put it into something which locks it in for some period and have a maximum sequestration. So I think we have to look in into this when we talk about the correct management of our biological resources. Growth in that case is a good thing. Most important leverage points, uh, if, uh, if you ask me for the top three in that diagram, are the big one in the middle between agriculture, health, uh, and nutrition. Um, uh, invest in, um, in those four which are listed there. Secondly, the outer loop between um, health, nutrition, and markets. So uh, we don't get to a safe and sustainable food system without the private sector. So that has to... Um, there has to be a change of mindset. And lastly, um, uh, top down uh, the uh, market insurance and the income employment linkages. So those would be, for me, the, the top, uh, uh, top um, investment points of entry for policy. We must watch that we don't do blah, blah about food systems. A system, system theory 101 is uh, you need to define the boundaries 
Uh, this is a global food system, but the EU has a system. We have local food systems. So we, we must, as scientists, be crystal clear what we, how we define the system we want to influence. Thank you. Uh, just maybe to add uh, to the last thing which was uh, said, I think uh, in, in the food system, the whole political economy of the change is quite difficult. And we have seen that in reality, how if you want to adopt any kind of a decision through the Commission and then Council and Parliament, the things actually get watered down to a large extent. And uh, in many cases, actually today, uh, arguments are used that uh, the food security is very important, which of course we all know that it's very important, and uh, that we have to take care that we can produce food for 9.5 billion, which we will have in the mid of the century. I think. The essence is that we can today already, with a bit of optimization of land, which it's basically currently we're using as from your data, it's coming a lot of land uh, for the feeding animals through cereals and then uh, basically feeding animals to people. So we have this indirect chain, not direct chain of feeding cereals to people, which is of course double use of the land and uh, also with the fact which was mentioned by, by Joachim saying, uh, uh, mentioning the food, uh, the food waste. One third of the food which we are throwing away, it's not one third of food which we throw away. It's one third of land, it's one third of energy, it's one third of pesticides, it's one third of everything. So uh, I think it's a bit Ill, Ill, not correct, not fair to talk only about food security without a, primarily addressing those issues. And uh, that's sometimes not the first thing which we talk about. Uh, and the second point which I would do is uh, the distribution of income in the food chain. This is also, I think, quite a critical question which would need to be addressed. First part of the question, did we address mm -hmm. this first part? Everything yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused because we have five more minutes left and we have one question here. Thank you, um, Thank you. So thank you for uh, the very good presentation, much appreciated. My name is Juliette and I work for Starch Europe and Starch Europe is one of the founding members of the European Bioeconomy Alliance. Um, so my question is actually to the panel. One of our main goals is to mainstream the concept of the bioeconomy beyond the converted. Um, and I think the update of the bioeconomy strategy is a success in that regard with the cooperation with the uh, 14 DGs, so really well done on that. But we see that um, the oldest concept in the world is, not, is very little known outside the expert areas. And um, I was wondering whether you would have any advice to give on how to reach out to, for instance, the European Parliament and the broader society. And then if I may, I take my starch Europe hat, because as starch producers, we also produce plant proteins. And um, how do you think that plant protein products score on the cross benefits of the systems the change approach that we need? Um, what can you do to act on food patterns, um, on changing the diets to reach a higher part of the plant proteins versus the animal proteins? I mean, my question is, do you envisage uh, recommending policy actions or reaching out to consumers uh, to promote the plant protein products? Thank you. If I may give one very brief uh, answer to this first part on the reach out. The Commission has a, a knowledge center on bioeconomy where we are trying to put all the information which is relevant in this context and you can just Google it and find everything there. Um, on the second one, the plant proteins, I'm quite fascinated by this development of these, these uh, at, no, no, um, not artificial meat, meat made out of, of plant products, uh, the biggest ever success on the, on the stock exchange uh, the last year was this, um, what was it? impossible meat. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. I think um, your protein question is huge. The, not only Europe, but the world needs a different protein strategy because of the whole feed area. Uh, global the German Bioeconomy Council has done a paper on it. It will be a key topic at the 
next year's Global Bioeconomy Summit in Berlin. So I hope to see you there, Juliet, uh, November 19, 2020. Thank you. A bit of optimism, uh, circular economy, for example, was five years ago actually not known. On the, in the UNIA, United Nations Environment Assembly, two years ago, it was actually prohibited to put it in any conclusions. If you look it to the conclusions from this March, it is all over the place. So I think these uh, new concepts and the, the understanding that uh, it's simply inevitable that we do some changes in our economic system, the way uh, how we produce and consume, it's becoming uh, part of the story. The only thing where I'm worried is that the urgency is still not there. How, how uh, serious the questions are and how quickly they would need to change. So uh, if you want to reach people, I think the, the simple formula is simplify to the extent that you are still correct but uh, say it in a way that it's understandable to the broad audience that they understand that you try to help with uh, your solutions. And when it comes to circular and bioeconomy, which is normally uh, sometimes uh, the, the question, uh, don't compete but cooperate because it's in essence very much the story where you have a lot of synergies, develop those synergies and make them efficient, sufficient because the real enemies to those concepts are out of your space, not in your space. Thank you very much. I think this, this we have um, unfortunately no more time for, for questions, but I would like to thank our panel members for being here, for your interesting presentations and your answers to all the questions. I also would like to um, thank the organizing team who put a lot of work in putting this session together. Um, if you want to speak to us, I mean, and also to the panel members, if they're here, if they don't hide somewhere in the VIP lounge, uh, they're available for you, I think. Thank you for that. Um, we're also, the colleagues are available in the village uh, downstairs. So I think we are booth uh, four um, for Global Challenge 6, so you can find us there. Um, tomorrow we have a session on food systems. There's a session this afternoon on energy, so many more sessions linked to bioeconomy. But thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy the rest of the RNI days and thank you to everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.